Another interesting chapter, actually, on synchronization. Uh, so I hope to complete this by tomorrow, which is maybe a bit optimistic, but I was looking at the schedule, and I think I'm still on schedule. Actually, I was kind of surprised that I was completed Chapter 5 yesterday. Uh, this should now work for me, and it's not working. Okay, I want to start with talking about clocks. It's actually kind of nice. Uh, first, uh, physical clocks, that's the, the easy part. Then, uh, today I'll be talking about logical clocks, which is still relatively easy. And tomorrow I'll continue with vector clocks, and that's just hard stuff. Um, but let's start with physical clocks first. So the whole idea is that uh, in many distributed systems, it actually makes sense to have an accurate notion of time. Now you have to realize that in a distributed system, um, because the whole system can be spread across a very large network, having an accurate notion of time or relying only on an accurate notion of time is, is in principle ridiculous because there is always a delay between two nodes. So no matter what, if we would all have clocks, after some time the clocks would be drifting away and then we'd have to synchronize again and whatnot. Um, and that's the reason, by the way, why I will be talking about logical time, because often you use clocks to order things. Nevertheless, timestamps are extremely useful. And what I first want to do is tell you a bit on how you can actually use clocks in a distributed system in a very useful way. So um, the solution to using exact time is called universal coordinated time. That's UTC, because it originated in French. Uh, are in, in France, uh, and it's based, uh, I think it's still based actually on the number of transitions per second of the cesium-133 atom. Uh, and yes, that's pretty accurate, but uh, even that is now being debated. So uh, uh, you have to realize, I'll be talking about clocks and satellites, uh, th they use these, these, uh, these very special clocks, and they are very accurate and they hardly drift. And then maybe if I have time I'll talk to you, I'll, I'll say a bit about uh, uh, clock synchronization in wireless networks, actually. So, um, okay, you have a bunch of these clocks, and that's how we actually know about time. And for some of you who actually uh, have read an, an article in the newspaper a couple of weeks ago, uh, what we're currently still doing is introducing this leap second from time to time every year to compensate for, you know, um, a mother nature not behaving according to our own standards. And the interesting thing is that uh, people have actually suggested, forget about Mother Nature, let's introduce our own, you know, kind of virtual notion of time and then who cares? Because it actually, it, it, it takes a lot of effort to uh, manage all this stuff and have this leap second and whatnot, and does it really matter? Maybe not. Okay. Um, you're, supposed, you're not supposed to be late, but if you're late, you have to be quiet. Um, what? Yes? I think this whole thing circles around the misconception that the turning of the world around the sun has something to do with power. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it has, it has its, uh, its uh, history in way back when. And uh, basically the suggest suggestion is let's forget about history and see what we could do practically today which is actually, uh, I think, a very valid discussion. It's the same discussion as about what is money, okay? Uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I, I, I hardly ever have money on me. I have credit cards and debit cards and what kind of stuff, and uh, sometimes it's kind of a nuisance, but uh, hey, uh, so what's money? I think it's you know, something that you use your, your smartphone with and then you transfer money to somebody else and just a bunch of figures. Um, until somebody tells me at a certain point that I lost all my money and that, hey, what's, what's going on? Now, important for our discussion right now is not money, but the fact that you can actually get um, pretty accurate timing if you take a look at the, uh, uh, the broadcast by satellites. It's up to less some, something like a half a millisecond, which is not too bad. And we actually can get better. Now, um, suppose we do have a distributed system that relies on... Uh, a real clock. So let's assume you have a bunch of these UTC receivers. 
uh, you still would have to distribute time to all of these machines. So the assumption is that you may have a network or a distributed system with machines that have an accurate notion of time, but your machine does not have an accurate notion of time. So what do you do? You need to distribute it. Um, now, the basic principle here is that every machine has a timer that generates an interrupt. Okay? And the inter interrupts uh, come at h times every hour, a second. And there's a clock in the machine that ticks on each timer interrupt. Now, you all, for those who've taken a course on uh, operating systems, you know this. You have this clock interrupt handler, it is their, your canonical example of how to write a, uh, the simplest driver you can imagine, namely a clock interrupt handler. Okay? Um, now, very simple. If CPT is the value of the clock that I have in my, on my machine, whereas t is the real time. That's the simplest way of looking at it, okay? And what you're trying to look at is the situation where CPT, what I have on my clock, is actually corresponds to the real time. In other words, the slope should be one. That's this figure. So what you would preferably s want to have is that if you measure time for real and you see what your clock is showing you, you would like to see this line over here. But that's not the way how it works. How many of you work with wireless uh, sensor networks? Ah, one. Only one? Two. Okay. Well, hi. So. You notice that if, if, if your sensor nodes get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, then your clock drift becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, the problem with wireless sensor networks is they have to talk to each other, these nodes. And, uh, for example, if you think it's time T1 and your neighbor thinks it's time T1 plus delta, but in such a way that it's going to miss its the slot when it's going to receive your message, those two will no longer be able to communicate with each other. So notably in, in wireless systems or where you have sloppy hardware, you will see uh, clocks drift rapidly. And fast clocks will show a time that is much higher than the actual time, and slow clocks will show a slow clock. So you'll think it's, it's, uh, it's 2 o'clock where uh, you know, it's really 3.30. Okay. So in practice, you see that there is this, this deviation, this row, and the whole goal is then never to have two clocks in any system differ by more than delta, delta time units. If that's your goal, then you have to synchronize every delta over two row seconds, or time units, I could say. Okay, so that's when your whole clock synchronization algorithm starts to work. Um, now, before I tell you how you can actually do this, for real, and again, I will stick to the principles because if I would have to explain NTP, are there any NTP knowledgeable people here? How many of you have installed NTP? Very good, okay. Have you ever looked in how NTP actually works? There's a whole book on this thing. Half of the book is filled with math. That's scary, right? But it actually is it, implemented. But before I explain a bit about the principle of NTP, um, Let's see how you can actually, in principle, derive T from your GPS system. Um, and the, the principle, you all guess I, you know what GPS is all about. This is a deviation of a figure that I have in the book. And I've always told myself, you know, you have, have to adopt, adapt this figure. And this is what I did um, yesterday. And the only difference with the figure in the book, are there are two differences. The first difference is that I added another circle. And the second difference is that these numbers change because they're now more accurate. What this thing shows you are um, three satellites somewhere up there in the air. And this is kind of an artificial situation. And what I'm trying to show you is that each of these satellites has a radius that when they intersect, you actually get to this point. And what happens in practice, of course, is what you do, and I'll explain this later more accurately, what you do is you measure your length your distance to these satellites. And then theoretically, it's, you have three circles that uh, then intersect exactly at this point, and that means that you can compute your own position. Okay? And this is how GPS works. What I didn't show you is that you need a fourth one because this is just a two-dimensional case, and of course you need the three-dimensional case. 
I thought he was going to talk about time. Well, he is. So let's assume that the clocks of the satellites are accurate and synchronized. Strong assumption. Okay? Not too bad, but still a strong assumption. So if you're going to ask me, how does GPS work for real? Then I will have to point you to another thick book. And uh, that's where it will be explained how you handle all these assumptions that I'm now making which are not accurate. Uh, so here's another one. Uh, well, this is not an assumption, this is true. It takes a while before a signal actually reaches the receiver. Good, okay? And the receiver's clock is definitely out of sync with the satellite. That is a very good assumption, okay? Because otherwise, why would you even bother about time? So this is what you want to do. Now, just think along with me, and then we're not going to do any computations, but I will uh, explain to you why you get time for free in a GPS system, okay? The red ones are the ones that are unknown. And I have a delta R, which is, and I'm, I'm looking at a single satellite with a position up there and you with your GPS device, okay? So I have an unknown deviation with the receiver's clock. Don't worry about this. This is one of my variables. I have it over here. I have the satellite over there. I get some signals and here I am, okay? I have unknown coordinates of the receiver. I don't know where I am. So XR, YR, and ZR are my unknown coordinates, and I want to find those, okay? And as a nuisance, I don't know what the deviation is of my clock. Every message that is sent by a satellite is timestamped. So here's one simplification. I'm assuming that the clocks in the satellites are accurate and synchronized. And now you can easily imagine if I have to drop that assumption, I may have to start compensating for a lot of things. But let's not, let's keep it simple so that I can stick to the principles, okay? The blue delta I is my time minus the time that the satellite stamp, time stamped its message plus my unknown deviation in my clock. This is the measured delay the measured delay of the message sent by satellite I. So basically, I, I, I get something, I measure my time, say, okay, I know now what the measured delay is. And I'm taking into account that my clock is deviating. I don't know how much, don't worry, I'm gonna solve that in just a minute. The measured distance to the satellite is, of course, C, which is the speed of light, times delta I. And notice it still has um, uh, this unknown deviation into it, okay? So I'm saying, okay, I know what the speed of light is, and I know where my satellite is, and I'm again making a very important assumption, light is now traveling in a straight line to my satellite. Not true. Not true for real. So here, th this is the other half of this thick book, you know? But you, you get the picture. You have to compensate for that. There are people who are worried about this. So if you want to be accurate, so let's, let's, let's make a deal. If you want to stick to the principles, it's okay, okay? If you want to know it for real, you need to compensate for this. To what extent it actually is uh, a determining factor in the outcome, that's another question. And I would argue with you, maybe not such a big deal, but big enough for certain people to worry about it. Okay, now the real distance is the following. It's a very simple equation. The real distance is C times delta I minus C times delta R, right? Because I had a deviation in my measurements, which is exactly this equation over here. XI minus XR, I don't know XR, YI minus YR, and ZI minus ZR. I don't, just don't know. Okay, so this is what I have. So far so good, this is all to one satellite. Good. I take four satellites, and then I have four equations and four unknowns. Hey, I can com compute delta R, I'm done. 
And my four unknowns are only xr, yr, zr, and delta r. That's the principle. And that's why I can get the time for free. And that's the reason why I don't understand that if you have this navigation system in your car, that you have to synchronize it by hand. I don't understand what this means. I mean, it has all the information to give me the accurate time. Is the principle clear? And really, I am, I am glossing over many, many important things. Um, a very strong assumption, clocks are synchronized and they are accurate and they don't drift, okay, At, in the satellites, which is simply not true. So you need, in practice, more satellites to get an accurate measurement. And this is the reason why if you take a GPS device, uh, what will happen is that, uh, you, can, you can do this with your smartphone, by the way, that uh, if you monitor when you actually get your first estimate of where you are, it should be after four satellites. If somebody gives you three satellites, I don't know exactly how they do this, but if you have four satellites, you get your first estimation. And then it's a very crude one, you know, it's within so many hundred meters. But that has everything to do with the, uh, with the ac accuracy that they're assuming. And the more satellites that they get, the less important are the assumptions you make with respect to the clocks in the, in the satellites, for example, and the more accurate you actually can get your time measurement. Okay? But unfortunately, we don't have the satellites in our distributed system. So we just have this UTC receiver, and it has the distributed work. Now, what you can do, and again, I'm glossing over many, many, many details. Every machine asks a time server for the accurate time at least once every delta over two rho seconds. Okay, your time units. And this is what the network time protocol actually does. Um, the nasty thing here, if I'm a server... I can just ask this time server what the time is. Uh, sure, I can ask that. But, you know, just, just see what happens. I'm an a let's say I have an application. So I have a message that goes through the operating system, has to travel the wire, has to go up there, has to contact the receiver. Maybe it's in a re register or a buffer, whatnot, and the message goes back. So I need to know exactly what is going on in that entire path to actually compensate for the answer. So I, I'll get an answer back from that server. Hi, my time is now X. But by the time I get that response, it's no longer going to be X anymore. And I need to know very, very accurately what the, the delay in that path actually is. And the problem, of course, is that that delay is not a constant. It varies all the time. And I will get back to that tomorrow, where I will, is that tomorrow? Yes, I think tomorrow, where I will explain that you need uh, six dimensions to map every node in the Internet to a uh, um, uh, position in a Euclidean space, and where the distance between two nodes is an estimation of their latency. So that path is very important. You can't. Okay. Uh, how, how are you going to take the time to the real time? You can't. <laughs> you can estimate it. So what you'll do is um, you will apply all kinds of tricks, first of all, to get an accurate estimate of that actual delay. And again, you're making lots of assumptions. Um, and what you can often do is... Uh, get multiple measurements before actually saying, okay, this is what I'm, what I'm going to assume. Now, an important observation is that as soon as you're in a local area network, your, your uh, deviation in delays is going to be considerably less than, for example, the delays over the Internet. Uh, that's where you can make use of... So you would you try to reduce the variance in the internet-based stuff, but in the local area network, you can do a better job. Yes? Yes? What is the assumption you're making? 
Yes, so, so you could do multiple measurements, and if you can make the assumption that the delay is essentially either a constant or that the uh, delay towards the server is the same as the delay back, then you can make these calculations. These are not unreasonable assumptions in a local area network. They are definitely very unreasonable in a network that has a lot of jitter, for example. Okay? And that's really where the problem starts. So that's the reason why I'm saying that if you stick to a local area network, and I'm not defining exactly what a local area network is, a very simple one would be a single segment, okay? That's, that's pretty much okay. As soon as you start hopping across multiple segments, you may actually introduce, first of all, delays, but also jitter. And that's, that's where the story starts to become a bit more intricate, okay? Um, here's another principle. I like this one. Um, I'm not quite sure how many people actually still use it, but it's an interesting one to, uh, um, for a mindset. So what you do is you let the time server scan all the machines periodically. We go through this. You know, I'm a time server, and I, I go through all your watches. And then I know what the state of the world is. And then I start saying, hey, okay, you... You set your watch like that. You set your watch like that. You set your et cetera, et cetera. I tell everyone. And then the interesting thing is I haven't looked at a clock. I just take my own watch as the reference point, and what I, make, what I do is I make sure that you synchronize to my watch. So I can now tell you that it's um, uh, only half past three, Okay forget about the clock, half past three, and then, hey, I can go on and on, and I'll, I'll slow the clock down, and we'll all believe it's half past three. And then in two minutes from now, two minutes from now, I'll tell you that it's now uh, 3.31. And you'll say, okay, fine. Okay? That's all. And this is good, by the way. You may think, oh, my God, this is really a very boring class. Apart from that, okay, we're still all in sync. That's all fine. As long as you have this confined view, contained view of the world, hey, we're all doing fine. Um, now, there's one thing. I'm not going to tell you to set your watch on an absolute time. If I do that, I may be doing something wrong. I may be telling you to set your watch ba your clock back, your time back. That is not allowed. Okay? We all do this, by the way, in practice. You know, you say, oh, okay, it's not that time, you, you reset your date. But the problem is that if this deviation is huge, you may actually get in conflict with all kinds of processes that you have been running, for example, related to version management or compilation or things like that. Because uh, a system does make use of, hey, what time did I do something? So what I can tell you is to slow down your watch. Okay, and then slow down for so many time units until I know then for sure that you are in exactly the same sync as in a sync with your neighbor. That's that's uh, who I may have told you to speed up for a certain time because you were just behind. Okay, stuff like that. Yes. So you mean adjust the clock uh, one millis for instance one millisecond for every two actual milliseconds? Yes. Have <laughs> yes. Yes. So I'm not going to tell you what the exact time should be. I'm going to tell you what to do with your watch, either slow down or speed up for a certain time. And then I tell this to everyone. certain time, that is real time or again? Uh, that, I, 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 let's assume that uh, you do have an accurate enough clock, then I will tell you to speed up for the next two seconds with so many milliseconds for two seconds. That means that you will be moving your clock faster but after two seconds of real time, you'll be in sync with your neighbor. That's the whole idea. Okay? That's all I wanted to say about clocks, actually. Real clocks. I have a colleague in Delos who says, oh, why do you talk about clocks? I think it's because it's fun. But, and very important, actually. Um, they are used. Um, so I'm, I just explained a bit about NTP. But there's another protocol out there, I still have to dig into the details, um, that claim that they can be a tenfold more accurate than NTP. So NTP is the standard at the moment. It's the network time protocol. 
And off the top of my head, you can get um, accuracies in the order of milliseconds. I think tens of milliseconds. Maybe, maybe somebody over here who knows whether that's even more. But these guys claim that you can get into the range of nanoseconds. Whoa, that's good. I'll give you another idea. Uh, GPS, ordinary GPS, will give you an accuracy of hmm, uh, I wanted to say milliseconds, but I'm not hundreds of milliseconds, I believe. I'm not too sure. Does anybody know that? It Was it microseconds? It Yeah, very good thinking. I think you're right. I think it's in the order of microseconds. Um, but again, if you use very accurate receivers and enough satellites, uh, so it's all depending on the hardware, you can get also into the nanosecond range. Now, this is actually quite interesting. If you get into the nanosecond range and it is accurate, you may actually start to use real clocks for actually timestamping and taking decisions on when things have occurred. What I'll be arguing in just a minute is that clocks are generally not precise enough, so that's the reason why we're going to have a very intricate scheme of, um, uh, of making an account of when things happen before another thing, okay? independent of clocks, but if you have very, very accurate clocks, you can get rid of that discussion because you just look at your clock to see when something actually took place, and here it comes, you know that your neighbor has the same notion of accuracy as well, so also will come to the same conclusion. Okay, I think that's actually stuff that I wouldn't be surprised that maybe in 10 years from now, all these slides have gone, and I will just be zooming into clocks because we've reached that accuracy and then suddenly became important for distributed systems. Okay. They happen before relationship. So, like I said, it's not just about clocks. Maybe we're not really in, concerned about real time. What we are concerned about is when did X happen and when did Y happen and can I conclude that X happened before Y? That's really the whole thing. And if I don't have an accurate clock, I will have to apply different tricks. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So what is the happen before relationship? I'll just put up these slides. Um, first of all, you have to realize that what I'm going to talk about is, has been written down in a seminal paper by Leslie Lamport in 1974. And it is uh, probably, I, I certainly belongs to the most important papers in computer science. Uh, who is Leslie Lamport? Well, for those who use LaTeX, he also wrote LaTeX. So he, this is kind of a versatile guy, okay? And 1974 is way back when, and he's still up and running, and he's still doing cool stuff. Uh, but at that time, he wrote this paper, and people are still citing it. So I think that's pretty good. I'm never going to reach that, that, that phase, I can tell you. And he came up with the following. And after a couple of slides, you'll appreciate what this guy did. Um, let A and B be two events, okay, within the same process. And A comes before B, like I did instruction X and then I did instruction Y. What I write is that A happened before B. So this is simple. If A is the sending of a message and B is the receipt of that message, A happened before B, okay? Uh, this is actually where it starts to hurt because if you have clocks, that are not synchronized, even if they're logical clocks, then suddenly the sending of A could have happened after the receipt of B. Now, that doesn't make any sense, okay? And we want to make sure that that kind of nonsense does not, you know, sneak into your distributed system. And then, then we have the transitive relationship. If A happened before B and B happened before C, yes, that A happened before C. Now, for those who are uh, a bit of uh, the, uh, inclined into math, uh, what we're basically doing is introducing a partial ordering of events. Um, it's kind of a nasty word. Basically, it means that there are events that cannot be compared to each other. Completely independent events, you just don't know which one happened before the other. The fun thing is, you don't care. Yes? 
overlapping events. Events can overlap. But are they still uh, in a happen before relationship? Then they're not in a happen before relationship. But uh, I will also say you cannot say that they happened at the same time. The only thing that I'm saying here, this is, this is a one-way relationship. If I, know, if I know that A really happened before B, I write A happened before. If I don't know, then I say I just had two concurrent events. Okay? Now, what's the problem? Yes? Based on what you said, I would then uh, challenge your second claim that, that uh, A is the event of sending a message and B is the event of receiving a message. Yes. Uh, implies that A happened before B. Because I, I agree. I, okay. So, so if B is the reception of the message I sent, and A was the sending of that message, um, the happen before relationship, by definition, says A happened before B. Okay, that's it. So it's more of a definition than anything else. Um, the semantics is something else. And we'll get into the semantics at a certain point when I'll be talking about vector clocks, uh, saying, okay, the, a distributed system can keep track of a happened before relationship. But does that also imply that A really happened before B in the sense that there is also a causal relationship? Okay, and that's, I think that was actually what you were hinting at. Uh, and that can be challenged. Okay, so the, what is now the problem? I want to make sure that, uh, to keep it simple, I do not want to tag a message as being received before it was sent. Okay, that's the ultimate thing. That's what I want to prevent. So how do we maintain a global view of the system's behavior that is consistent with the happened before relationship? Okay. So you simply attach a timestamp. So th and if you were your, your ab observer, you would say, oh, dark, 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 dark. Okay, because you see that somebody is sending this message, oh, timestamp, and then, oh, receipt, oh, timestamp, which is bigger. So what you want is you want to attach a timestamp to every event that says that if A and B are two events in the same process and A happened before B, then we demand that the timestamp that you associate with A is less than the timestamp you associate with B. Of course. Likewise, if A is the sending of a message and B the, recep the reception of a message, I couldn't care less what timestamp you assign to that to those two events, as long as the timestamp you associate to A is less than the timestamp you associate to B. That's fine. Okay, so that's what we want. Good. We don't have an external observer. Okay? So we just have these simple processes that uh, jointly make up this distributed system, and they have to assign timestamps. Now we have a problem. So how to attach a timestamp uh, to an event where there's no global clock? That's the problem that we need to do. And they need to tackle. So we need a consistent set of logical clocks, one per process. And here we go. So I let every process maintain a local counter, okay? Um, and I will allow that process to adjust this counter. And the rules for adjusting it are very simple. Um, oh, another remark. When you study this material, I think it's safer to study the slides and then go back to the book. Um, let me announce the following. There, when, you, when you write a book, a, a textbook like Distributed Systems, you know, it covers a, a big area. And it, okay, it's my research area, but I'm not an expert on every area. And the interesting thing about textbooks is, is you can fairly easily see where the author or authors did not fully understand the material that they're writing about. And this you will understand when you read Vector Clocks. I, my bet is you'll, uh, I have been able to hide it a bit about logical clocks. Uh, vector clocks are nasty. And when I get to explaining um, uh, Byzantine fault tolerance, you'll see, did he really understand what was going on? And the answer is no, okay? <laughs> um, I still know it better than you guys, but I, I, I will instantly confess, do I have a deep understanding? If, do I have such a deep understanding of the topic that I can easily explain what's going on? The answer is simply no. And it shows in the book, okay? Now with logical clocks, you're safe. With vector clocks, 
Um, you're still very safe, but it's the ice is beginning to come a bit thin, okay? This part is okay. Um, and it just shows you, uh, it's actually, it is, how shall I put this? So I'm doing my best to make things seemingly simple. And this is where you have to watch out, because the theory underlying this stuff is not simple at all. But I don't, I want to conceal the theory and still come up with a story that makes sense to students. Okay. And this is already one part that many of you will find a bit confusing. I'm going to talk about logical clocks, but the only thing I'm going to do is count. There are no clocks. Okay, there are only counters. And I want to have a consistent set of these logical clocks, which are counters. And what I do is the following. If I have two successive events within process PI, then CI, is a, this is the local counter at process I, is incremented by one. What, will follows, what follows is that we won't be looking at events in a single process. We'll be only looking at sending and receiving messages. Okay, and here it comes. When I send a message, I'm process PI, I timestamp that message with, with the value of my current counter. So that's my, my value, okay? Now that message is received by its recipient. And let's say that's PJ. And then PJ does the following. It has a counter CJ, which has a specific value. It sets this thing to the maximum of what it had and the timestamp on that message. And then it increments the counter and moves on to the next event. Okay? What I'm, I'm doing here is the following. If I'm PJ and my counter is too low to receive a message that has been sent in my future, I'm fast forward into the future and say, okay, I received it at a time that is consistent with Lamport's logical clocks. Namely, I will attach a timestamp to the reception of that message, which is larger than the timestamp that it was sent. Yes? No, you, I receive a message, I then first adjust my counter, and then, oh, I see what you mean. Then I increment it, and then I assign the reception of, the reception of that message. The, the timestamp will then receive that incremented value, absolutely. So what I will definitely have is that the timestamp associated with the reception of the message will be larger than the timestamp associated with the sending of the message. Yes? And this is what I just mentioned. Um, uh, th so th this is the hard part. There are no clocks. There are only counters. No? I, I send you a message. Your counter is at zero. I send you a message. I timestamp it at one. You receive it at your local time zero. Counters, whatever. <laughs> you go into alert mode because you say, how can I receive a message from my future? Impossible. I must be late. So you fast forward your clock to two you fast forward your counter to two, and you assign the reception of that message, that is an event, timestamp two. Hey, everybody happy. Yeah, so formally, you do the following. You look at the timestamp in the message, which is one. Your counter is zero. So the, so the counter becomes one, and then you increment it, okay? That's the reason why I said I, I, I have been giving this some thinking. You first, well, watch it. You first set it to the maximum, then you execute this step. I, there's more information here. So this is where you associate the timestamp with the reception of the message before passing it to the application. So the application will see the right timestamp. Got it? And the assumption I'm making is that who sent the message was another application on pr a process PI.
let me see. I'm fast forwarding to this slide. This is the model that you need to take into account. I'll go back to the slide just before. You have applications that send stuff, okay? Then it reaches your middleware, it gets timestamped, it's sent through the operating system, it's received, and now it needs to be timestamped before you hand it over to the application. And the timestamp you associate in this case is one, at least one, more than the timestamp that was over here. Got it? I think that answers your question. Good. Okay, and this is, um, oh, okay, one thing. Uh, this, this, the first property, namely, whoops, where is it? Uh, two events within the same process, okay. That's satisfied by this one. Yeah, that's trivial. But the sending and the receiving of messages and correct timestamping, that's the more important one. That's satisfied by these two, three, uh, by number two and three, okay? Uh, now, if you are worried about the fact that two events got the same timestamp, which may happen, okay, because uh, you and I, we both start at zero, and we, you know, we do things without communicating, so that means that we have events that have exactly the same timestamp. If you don't want that, it's very simple. You simply attach your unique process ID to those events, and then we uh, also order on the process identifier. So if your process identifier is lower than mine, all the events that have a lower timestamp because of your process ID uh, happened before mine. And I'm not implying that there's a causal relationship. That's, that's an important one. Got it? Okay. This is how it works in practice. You have three processes. If we don't do anything with Lamport's clocks, Uh, yes, you do. I'll give an example in just a minute. Um, and uh, to hint at what, uh, what, what could happen is that you have uh, two concurrent updates receiving the same local timestamp, okay? And they can be processed through the system, and now you need to decide who, go, who goes first. And if you have nothing else but just exactly the same timestamps and process IDs, you have a tiebreaker. And if everyone behaves like this, then there's no problem. And otherwise, yes, there would be a problem because you and I could then decide, oh, well, okay, same things, uh, really doesn't matter. But in case of concurrency, it could be a problem. Okay? So this is what you would do if you did not have this scheme. You have these three processes. I'm taking a simplified approach, namely that this clock counter is incremented in the steps of 6, 8, and 10, respectively. So this guy over here sends a message at its local clock value 6, gets received at 16, no sweat, that's okay, sends it at 24, is received at 40, that's all fine. It sends a message here at 60, which is now received at 56, bad news, sends another message at 64, which is then received at 54, no good. What you do in Lamport is like this, M1, M2, that's all fine. You send it at 60, it arrives over here at its local clock 56, P2 comes to the conclusion that's a no-go, adjusts its local counter to 61, increments it now for the next event with 8 units, namely 69, that thing is then received at P1 at its local value 54, and it gets adjusted to 70, at least 70. And then P1 continues then with 76. So you always fast forward, okay? What I have accomplished is a consistent time stamping of events in the presence of sending and receiving messages, okay? Now, before I talk about a nifty application, let's take a break. <laughs>